Welcome to the Whole Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you become a fat burner, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. So I'm Debbie Potts. I'm the host of the Whole Athlete Podcast. And today is our new adventure. Peter and I are going to start doing some webinars together to help teach you how to become a fat adapted athlete. And I'm going to talk more the importance of building the whole you from the inside out, working on liver congestion and the digestive system repair and rebuild as we talk about the importance of being a fat burner and balancing your blood sugar. A lot of people I find from my experience and as I journey into more of a health coaching side of athletic coach and trainer, that there's a lot of liver congestion and digestive issues. And we are going to give you some options for that, but don't forget to go to the survey so I can check on there as we go. And then Q&A, just start putting in your questions. We'll leave time last 20 minutes for some questions. Oops, now of course I can't switch my screen. So my personal story, I've been a personal trainer for 25 plus years. I started getting into more nutritional therapy and health coaching over the last 10 years. And I've also been a triathlete and a runner and cyclist for over 20 years. And my story I wrote in my book, Life is Not a Race, that's on Amazon. I wrote it three years ago today, actually. I just got a little Facebook reminder. But I share my personal story in there and it, it kind of correlates with what I'm doing now. I'm on a mission to help people prevent them from going through what I had happened back in 2013 as I was on the triathlon kind of high and been racing Ironman since 2001 and marathons before that. And I was just feeling very fit and strong and fast. And then suddenly my life changed after uh, reaching my best PR times in 2012. Ironman Hawaii, then did a 50K trail run, and then I did a marathon and, you know, thought I was invincible. So knowing what I know now, it's I approach things a little differently than thinking more is better when you're so fit. But I gained 30 pounds in three months. I was not able to do any of my training as I did before. And it just kind of felt like I woke up overnight and I was just had no strength. And I started this journey trying to get help. And it led me down this road as I became a nutritional therapy practitioner a Paul Check Institute. They have a holistic lifestyle coach. I've done Ben Greenfield's superhuman coach program where I met Peter back when all this started in 2013. And then I just am wrapping up the functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner program so I can help people because no one could help me. And no one could seem to understand from athletic performance of a, someone that's a type A athlete, type triple A person that you know, the struggle is real. And as we'll talk a little bit today about, and there's more on my podcast that contributes chronic stressors from external internal contribute to creating metabolic chaos and this domino effect of symptoms in your body that could be far removed from what actually is going on. So I created the Holistic Method program back in 2014, and I wrote a manual that has a chapter in each of these elements. And the book keeps growing because I need to keep updating it as more and more research comes out. So nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, movement, mobility, digestion, and gut health, hydration, and my favorite, especially for us type A athletes and driven people, more happiness, play, and gratitude. And you can see with the infographic, all these elements really need to be somewhat in balance and to have homeostasis in our balance in our life, in our body, we need to work on all these. So a lot of us athletes just focus on our training and perhaps nutrition, but they forget how sleep and stress impact your exercise and nutrition, as Peter will touch on, and hydration people forget about, and digestion and gut health. I mean, chronic stress from external sources as well as internal sources will create havoc on your gut and digestive system as a whole, but also leaky gut and inflammation in your body and all these other things. So those are all important elements, what I coach people on. 
I created a, a group online program. We just launched this last month. We just finished up today our first 30 day online group coaching program, but I developed this over 10 years ago and it's just evolved into a three part program where we work on a liver detox and work on your liver congestion and getting it functional at optimal level. And then we work on digestion as we repair and reset your digestive system. And then we go to maintenance. How do we do this? And of course we work on nutrition along the way, but those eight holistic method elements. So repairing and rebuilding and resetting is really important for the low carb athlete. I think a lot of athletes are looking at just their exercise, as I said, but nutrition, we'll talk with Peter more about how to optimize your fat metabolism. But I think a lot of these athletes out there, especially I was just at Ironman Hawaii in Kona for two weeks, that a lot of athletes are still on the carb loading program and eating a lot of sugar and not realizing the impact that makes on not just your performance, but your longevity. So we want to work on nutrition, but we have to reset the body before we start to become fat adapted. There's more to it than just piling on lots of carbs or carbs, taking out the carbs and piling on the fat and protein. I think there's a lot of people, especially us athletes that have, you know, stressed our body for so many years, we really need to reset as we were doing this, adding more fat and protein into our diet, being low carb athletes. So just to touch on a little bit symptoms of stress and how they correlate with what we call an FDN is metabolic chaos. As you can see, if you're seeing the infographic here, we've got seven common symptoms of stress. And of course we know nutrition wise, there's sugar, refined sugar that's given us a lot of stress, but their common symptoms of stress lead to headaches, fatigue, sleeplessness, sinuses, allergies, moodiness, irritability, tension in the neck and back and digestive problems, of course. But if you can see a little bit of the graph, I'll go into it more on my podcast. I'm doing Wednesdays. We're doing more health building focused seminars, podcast episodes, but metabolic chaos relates to all these different symptoms. And a lot of what Peter will get into why it's important to be able to optimize your fat metabolism because a lot of this metabolic chaos we create is from the nutrition and lack of digestion and excessive stress we put on our body. So what I talk a lot about is stress, chronic stress, and that comes from exercising too much, not giving yourself enough repair and recovery time because we always think more is better, right? I just did a 50K run, might as well do a marathon, that's nothing. So we can tend to do a little bit too much to be overachievers. So what I keep talking about in my podcast over the many years is the heart rate variability and testing it one on the different apps out there, but really the importance of avoiding being stuck one side or the other. We need to have resiliency so we can go back and forth like a teeter totter and have strength in both sides. And a lot of people, I talk about my group program about being sympathetic dominant and how that's going to impact your ability to properly digest your food. Not only do we eat our food multitasking and eat too quickly that we don't chew our food correctly, but we also shut off those digestive processes that you can see over the left-hand side here are impacted if you are eating in a sympathetic mode. So we talk a lot about that. So digestion and gut health is obviously an important part of our overall health. And then what Peter will talk about being fat adapted, we want to work on eating the right macronutrients to balance our blood sugar and teach our body how to burn fat as our main fuel source and not carbohydrates. As you already know, because you're coming on the show, but I think what I try to stress, and I'm talking at KetoCon next year and other conferences, that stress impacts everything. So if I'm already low carb on my fuel plan, I'm working out metabolically efficient, I'm doing my mafetone training, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Well, my story I shared in my book, I was doing all this many years ago, 10 years ago, and I still became exhausted and found myself you know, living life as a race and as in the acute phase of HPA axis dysregulation or metabolic chaos. And I suddenly that one day in March, 2013 was in the exhaustive phase of the HPA axis dysfunction. I progressed without even knowing I was in acute phase. So over time, I 
became insulin resistant because of the way I was living life as well as hidden internal stressors. So their gut brain connection is really important as our digestion is and our gut health to our brain health and inflammation in your body. I won't go too much into this slide because I want to get to Peter, but really looking at the microbiome and talking more about that. I have two great podcasts and hopefully more to come with Karan of Megasporobiotic supplement I suggest clients use, but the microbiome labs and the research Karan has been a part of, it's pretty amazing about LPS and translocation of that bacteria in our gut and how that increases our inflammation in our body. So I won't dive into this as well too much because it's a whole hour in itself, but really the importance of gut health and reduce your inflammation is neutralizing those toxins. And we have to, to do that. You have to have a proper detoxification system, your liver, and you're re reconditioning your gut and rebuilding that mucosal layer. So we use microbiome labs program. It's a three month supplementation you can use to rebuild that gut along with the right coaching program. So what I keep telling everybody, it's not just what you eat, but when you eat and how you eat it. So we talk a lot about fasting, intermittent fasting, and the benefits of fasting as well as when you are eating. So time-restricted eating. And I really find that becomes what Peter talks about, what I love is intuitive nutrition. That I'm, I've done this for years and I didn't know there was a title to it. I didn't know I was being a keto athlete and metabolically efficient, I knew about. But metabolic flexibility kind of turned a little differently. And this whole fat adapted athlete stuff, we've both been doing for 10, 15 years without having a label to it being a ketogenic diet or keto cycle, cycling in our carbs more on the weekends. And we talk about that more on our other podcasts, but the benefits of time restricted eating, I have my clients doing the program that we do a 16 hour intermittent fast and an eight hour eating window. And once you become fat adapted, you really just have it happen automatically. I haven't eaten yet today because I've been busy and I'll eat after this. And I I had to stop eating three hours before bed. So suddenly this word is called one meal a day is OMAD. And there's a term for everything now, but we didn't know what we're doing. It's just natural. When you're not hungry, you're not going to eat and you don't have those cravings. So a lot of our health is going to be improved if we optimize our liver function. So the hormone balance and these other hidden stressors include working on your liver function. So we address that when we do our health coaching program to rebuild the whole you from the inside out. So just a few things on the list here of solutions to improve your detoxification. We do this in my online program, really focusing on sleep and getting outside, getting exposure to that sunshine and infrared therapy or hot cold showers and colon therapy, people can do it coffee enemas. I have not done that yet, but I know it's good. I don't know if I'll ever do one, but it's, it's good to do. But a lot of all this stuff we're talking about is lifestyle changes. So you can't just find a supplement to treat everything. So we work on transforming the whole you with what I said, a holistic method with a whole program and trying to create new lifestyle habits and eating habits. So the supplements I have people in our program do, I'll just give you more information later. And I'm going to do a podcast and blog on this, but the mega score and the Quicksilver is really just the supplements we need to aid in our transformation of improving that gut health. And a lot of it can be improved by fasting, but a lot of times we need to add some sea salt and bone broth. We do a lot of and uh, apple cider vinegar and the mitochondrial support. It's really important. So just to wrap up my side of it, and I'll bring on Peter, and his slides are coming up next, but just really focusing on eating real food and balancing the blood sugar. I have my clients, I'll use Keto Mojo to test their glucose in the morning and their ketones because you don't know where you are on your macronutrients unless you measure. And really what we'll talk about is eating more fat to burn fat and finding a little lower carbs, but as I want to do more of this topic is women might be a little different depending on their menstrual cycle. And there's a lot of different information on there, but sometimes you just kind of intuitively know you need to add more carbohydrates. So you don't always need to measure. Once you get started, you learn to listen to your body and you'll know how much to eat and when you feel full and satisfied for hours. That's an easy measurement. If I haven't eaten yet and I'm not 
hungry after I have my meal, I knew I made the right ratio of proteins and fats and getting more of the leafy vegetables. But really, it's individual. And we both agree with the importance Headings. of jelly. Double phone options. So, <laughs> power off. Shutting down. Yes. Shutting down. Your hey. sound's coming through. Can you? Yeah, no, I'm shutting my phone off because oh. somehow it switched over to the... Okay. The, so what do you, do you, you're going to talk next, Peter, about intuitive nutrition. And I think that's really the goal of being optimizing your fat metabolism. So food to avoid. I won't go into this because I'll have you do that. Exercise and sleep and really these hidden stressors we measure with hormone, immune function, digestion, detoxification, energy and your neurotransmitters. So we do five functional labs when we do the FDN program with clients, when I do it, with clients being a health detective basically. So I'm working on solving your metabolic chaos with you with the labs and this holistic method elements we need to work on the lifestyle habits. So repairing, rebuilding, cal recalibrating, what we're gonna talk about when I do coaching programs in my podcast, but Peter will dial in a little bit more about Vespa and his OFM program. But just to stay connected, the podcast, I have switched it this month. Mondays are going to be interviews. Wednesdays are talking about health coaching and functional lab testing, all that stuff. And then Fridays we're talking hopefully more with Peter once a month, and then I'll be diving into more uh, swim, bike, run, and different athletic training tips and stuff like that for the low-carb athlete. So let me move to Vespa, and then Peter, I'll let you take the show over, and then you just have to tell me when to switch your slides. Let's talk okay, about Okay, all right. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, like, you know, ah. Uh, anyway, hi, I'm Peter Defty, and I'm the general manager of Vespa Power Products and the uh, creator of the, the – uh, OFM program, which is Optimized Fat Metabolism, which um, started as an outgrowth of supporting Vespa clients so they could get the most out of Vespa. Because when I first used Vespa back in 2006 and ran Western States on it, um, it was just through this chance thing that a friend sent, said, she tossed me some pouches and said, hey, my friend swears by this stuff. You should try it. So I had a good run. And I was already open since I'd started doing a fat adapted sort of diet um, in 2000 and was adding, doing a lot of protein and fat at my diet, I was already open to the idea of a product that would, you know, supercharge your, your fat metabolism. And so um, what Debbie's got here is, is we do a very similar thing. And what I want to start off with um, is to say that one, I, there's three things that I come to that are, that are, sort of like consistent and, and that is you are an individual and the important part of that is today's world companies are all trying to tell, sell you stuff i'm trying to sell you vespa okay uh, i'm going to say that caveat just to be completely upfront and, and transparent but i'm also going to say you're an individual and so the point there is people are trying to lump you into different segmented market so you can they can commoditize you so having a coach that like debbie or myself or one of my coaches um that can actually work with you one-on-one -on -one to individualize a program to your needs and your situation is really cool important to get that best um, result for you because you're going to do well on any training program you'll do you'll do better if you get the right diet but but really a lot of the things are being sold and told on the internet by all these gurus. It's about, you know, making you a commodity so they can sell you a commodity. Um, I don't know if you make sense, but I wanted to get that out there because I think that, you know, Debbie's really dedicated to her clients. And that's, that's the point is you having a coach that's going to spend time with you, get to know you and learn how to implement various strategies in a way that work for you is key. So let's, let's start with, um, uh, that uh, if you go back, you know, to the slide before Debbie on the, the mm -hmm. that's, that's the conventional wisdom right there. A bunch of goose taped to the bar on, a, on the bike in the T1 transition, mm -hmm. a conventional high carb approach. And this is sheer insanity. And as I say, primitive man didn't get up in the morning, have a bowl of oatmeal, grab a couple of gels, his spear and go out hunting. 
No, he had to get up and he was fasted and he had to go out and hunt as if his life depended on it. And that's what got us here, folks. That's what made us robust, strong athletes to do Ironman triathletes, not having a bunch of gels. And I'm not saying that the gels aren't important. They have a place, but this, folks, is insanity. And this is what it has come to. So go ahead, Debbie, the next slide. Well, let me add in too, if you guys, those are listening to, on the live broadcast here, we have a survey. So we we can kind of cater the topic today of what sports you do. We've had two of you say you're running and then there's other, there's um, different sports. But so we've got one person, the runner, and then one said other just working on, I think, longevity. But just remember to go to that poll you'll see and answer that so we know who we're talking to. So if you're not a triathlete, we won't focus on triathlon so much as other options. Yeah. But the, the idea is you have plenty of body fat on you, limit, virtually limitless calories to fuel your, your exercise. And that should be the majority energy source. And that's what we focus, focus on in optimizing your fat metabolism. Because when you do that, I do suggest you use carbs for your in-race or in-training fueling most of the time, but very strategically, okay? And then they really work like they're supposed to. So let's go ahead and start with some a little basics on, on energy partitioning in the humans. This is the stuff you don't get told because there's no money in it because you're going to use your own body, body fat instead of external calories. I'll move it over. Sorry, I just got that we're not showing the right things on the screen. So let me just make sure everyone can see the slides. You there you see. go. Okay, so this first slide is about the, the, the three basic fuel substrates that, that your body uses to make energy. You got ketones up there with 22 ATP, glucose with 29, and then you got fatty acids, 129 ATP. There's no big mystery there which one you wanna be using for your main energy source. And, and the point is, we're meant to burn fat aerobically. And unfortunately with this high carb mantra, we've gone from using the carbs well to overusing them. And, and that overuse has shut down our ability to metabolize fat at the rates that evolution, God, however you want to interpret it, it all makes sense, whatever end of the spectrum you're on, whether you're on a full-blown creationist spectrum or Richard Dawkins, full-blown science spectrum, any, or anything in between, it all makes perfect sense that we're meant to burn fat because we have limitless calories and we have a very robust glucose storage and glycogen, but we're not meant to use that the way we've um, transformed that into our main fuel source. That's where he, we humans and our ingenuity have created some unintended consequences. So let's go to the next slide, which is on all roads lead to acetyl-CoA. So when you go into the Krebs cycle, this is the metabolic pathway that generates your energy. It, the, these energy substrates all end up as acetyl-CoA fed into the Krebs cycle to make a ATP. Go ahead and let's go to the next cycle. And let's look at um, a high carb diet. So depending on the hormonal signaling and the enzymatic pathways that are that come out because of this hormonal signaling, we have various modalities, shall we say, of fueling. And this is the high carb um, approach where you have high insulin because you're putting in so much glucose in your diet and you're fueling. So you have to have that insulin to shove the glucose in and, and, and get rid of it in your bloodstream because high glucose in your blood is toxic. I mean, ask anybody who's a type one diabetic, if they don't give themselves insulin, they literally will go into a diabetic coma and die, okay? And in fact, the way that a diabetic attack was treated back before insulin was to have the person run or exercise vigorously, vigorously because that was the only way you could get somebody's blood sugar down quickly. So that's kind of interesting. And that's sort of how sugar became this sort of uh, supplement of choice for athletic performance because it gave that bang shot. Um, so it's characterized by high insulin. But when you have high insulin, that's signaling to your liver and your other organs that we need to deal with the high glucose. So we shut down these other pathways. So as I'm showing here, Beta oxidation is still going on because we always metabolize fat. If we don't metabolize fat, we're dead. 
It's just optimizing it. Okay. So it's, it, it down regulates our, our fat metabolism. It upregulates our glucose um, utilization, which means it's going to tap into that glycogen supply. It literally shut, tells the liver to shut down making both ketones and glucose. Um, to supply the metabolic need. So as you can see, that ha happens. And what does that do? It makes us entirely dependent on that limited fight or flight energy supply glycogen, which means we have to take in the exogenous calories. And this is how we, we as an athletic culture have been, been indoctrinated, for lack of a better term. I know I'm going over the top here. I'm not being very PC, <laughs> but I'll say it. Okay. We, uh, Debbie will agree with me, but we've been indoctrinated in this idea. You need lots of, lots and lots of carbs. And the problem is, is we we're using so much carbs chronically that it's become a problem. I mean, as I say, for most of human existence, we ate concentrated forms of carbs three to five times a year, not three to five times a day for decades. And that's where things have gone wrong. So let's, let's move on to the next slide, which is the keto. We're going to go to the other side of the spectrum which is the keto side of things. And as you all know, probably know, you've heard of keto, most of you have heard of keto. And we've got this wonderful situation right now where we have the high carb camp saying you gotta have carbs for performance. And you got the keto camp on the other side saying keto is the way to go and you can perform on keto and blah, blah, blah. And there's nothing in between. And, and what's, what's happened is you've got this cognitive dissonance on both sides where while the high carb camp is talking about how good carbs are, and they're right to an extent because you do need some carbs in there, they're totally ignoring the fact of what lots of sugar does to your body over time. Debbie can attest to that. She's gone through it, right? Most people can. And you, know, you look at the general health of the population of the United States, and you don't have to look far to see the effects of too many carbohydrates. There's more involved. Yes, there's processed food. There's there's vegetable oil, trans fats, um, xenoestrogens, xenotoxins, et cetera. But one of the big ones is just too much concentrated forms of carbohydrates all the time. Okay. But then you have the keto camp, which is saying you can perform on keto now. And this is why we have this one is because with a ketogenic approach, you're upregulating your fat metabolism, but you're not optimizing it. Keto is a conservation state. Okay, you're upregulating, tapping into your fat. Your liver will now make ketones and glucose to meet the metabolic need. It'll conserve glycogen. But in that, in that it, it becomes a conservation state because it's sensing that, that you need to conserve. And so a deep keto state will downregulate the PDH pathway, which is pyruvate dehydrogenase. And this is a key enzyme for being able to take glucose and convert it to energy really quickly. And so that's the main reason, in my opinion, that deep keto, um, deep keto has that limiting factor on performance. So it keeps you kind of stuck. So, and when you're stuck, you can't really drive your performance to get that adaptive stress you need to signal to your body to get stronger. And what we've seen, especially myself, is when I first started doing this, I got all the people like Debbie who were having GI issues and metabolic syndrome, and they'd run out of options. So they were willing to do something that conventionalism said didn't work because they'd exhausted all the conventional methods and it didn't work. Well, now we're still seeing those kind of people, but I'm seeing a lot of people now who are coming in with what I, I term as adrenal stress. The, the term adrenal fatigue is, is out there a lot, but folks, that is really a, a misguided term because, because full-blown adrenal fatigue is, from a medical standpoint, is we're really bad. It's, it's, not, um, it's not what we're meant, it's not what we're meant to be doing. Um, so we get adrenal stress. So I, we see a lot of people in adrenal stress because they're trying to push themselves. They keep trying to push themselves on a ketogenic diet and they can't, and their body's looking for the sugar because it's getting stressed and it's not there. So it pushes harder. And then you, you just overwhelm the, the body systems and the hormones and enzymes and wind up, you know, tanking in a very different way from somebody who's got too many carbs in their diet. 
So let's go to the next slide, which is OFM, where, where we're trying to upregulate all your, your internal energy pathways, but also give yourself that opportunity to use external pathways. So here we're, we're getting you, we're using uh, a ketogenic diet and ketogenic techniques to get that physiological shift. Um, but once that physiological shift takes place, we don't go into deep ketosis for two or three months. We, as soon as that initial week or two or three weeks, depends on the person, it could be two to three days for a well-adapted, athletically fit athlete. It can be two to three weeks for, for somebody, not so much. But once we get that initial shift by using a ketogenic diet, we start to train that athlete, build their aerobic base, um, learn to, to start to incorporate those strategic carbs and build up their build up and find out what their carb tolerance is, what their food sensitivities are, um, get their hydration down so they can push themselves, stress themselves in a way that that adaptive stress continues to make them stronger and fitter, more aerobically fit initially because that aerobic fitness on a fat adapted state actually causes a lot of mitochondrial biogenesis because when you're doing optimizing your fat metabolism, you're also optimizing metabolism, not just for energy, but for all the metabolic processes in your body, your, your cells, your mitochondria, your hormones, your enzymes, everything is delivered and run through fat metabolism. Carb metabolism is really just a source of energy or it goes to the liver and those carbs get converted into other substances like ketones and fats. So here we're balancing that so that you're turning up everything, your beta oxidation through your fat stores, we're releasing your livers releasing, converting fats into glucose and ketones. And then if you're racing or running hard, you, you're even tapping into your glycogen stores, but at a, at a sustainable level. Now this is your internal stores. And, and that's the point is to get your body to burn its own fat. And this is another problem I have with the keto world is they're pushing fat bombs and fat fueling and nut butters and, and all that. And, and that's not the point of, of this. The, the point is to be able to use your internal fat stores. You eat, you store, you go out and exercise. You use those stores like a fluid checking account. And this is, you know, like I said, the best detox is these long aerobic fat-based runs where your liver function is going. Instead of your liver taking in, constantly taking in excess calories and converting them into liver fat, or ketones, or glucose, or LDL cholesterols, it's, it's actually now able to go and release those into fat, get them metabolized, clean itself out, and go through this wonderful cycle of, of, of metabolism that our bodies are meant for. And so we, we balance that so that you can use all your pathways and then top it off with those strategic carbs. And in some cases, it's appropriate to use uh, more fat-based um, supplementation. All right, let's go to the next thing. And, and what does this result in? Let's do a few slides. This is the FASTER study by Jeff Bollock. Um, it's a comparison. It's not saying one's better than the other. It's just comparison of metabolic characteristics between high-carb and low-carb runners. And um, the, it, the low-carb cohort were people Virtually all of the people are people I've worked with. So in the real world, they don't do straight keto. They do a version of OFM and, and they were using Vespa in their training and racing to get that performance edge. Because as I said before, n you're not going to get your best performance on keto. But t this graph shows that the low carb diet is way up there at one, a mean of one and a half grams a minute. And the high carb is at 0.67. Now, previous to this, the science said that the upward max was, was one gram a minute, okay? And most people burned about a half a gram a minute. Well, so the high-carb guys are actually pretty good fat burners when it comes to the old science. And, but as you can see, the, the fat-adapted athletes are um, off the charts. And these, this is, these are people like Ben Greenfield, Zach Bitter, I'm going to name names, Anthony Kunkel, several people... Um, Dan Lynch, several people who are winning and podium at racing and setting records. So, you know, th these guys were well selected and well matched up with people who um, knew what they did. Hold on just a second, Debbie. You gotta... 
Let's go to the next slide. I, 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 okay, next slide. Go to, yeah, go to the next slide. Yep, we're on. Okay. All right, and this is the crossover. Um, and this is the George Books crossover comparison. And once again, the crossovers, the, the high carb diet people were right in line with the, the body of science to date, which is at about 60, 65% of VO2 max, you cross over from burning primarily fat to carbohydrates. But look at this with the low carb. They're crossing over at 70 to 80% of their VO2 max, which is right the sweet spot for endurance sports. But also it's where most aerobically fit athletes doing team sports like soccer or basketball, um, they're going to reside at that level too most of the time. Okay. But the, but the game changers, not only are they in that sweet spot of the intensity level, but because they're burning that, that 1.5 grams a minute versus the half a gram a minute, it's, it's just a total game changer in terms of what you can do in your, in your performance. So let's go to the next slide. And this kind of, this next slide sort of illustrates, um, that in terms of what you're able to use. And because you're tapping into your internal supplies, it allows your body to focus on the muscles performing rather than trying to digest. Okay. Next thing. Okay. So let's go to the next thing, which is the limitations of the science. Oh. And that is, um, oh, let me, yeah. So the limitations of science are that most most nutritional uh, studies on science um, don't qualify as science. The experimental design, it's just horrible. So people need to know that. The, the average consumer doesn't, and that's unfortunate because it, it gets a lot of bad information out there and agenda-driven um, science out there. And, it's, and, and unfortunately, I've come to the conclusion that most of the people putting out this stuff actually genuinely believe they're putting out good stuff. It's good intent. It's well intended, but not exactly right. And that's where, how we got to this whole problem with high carbs. And then um, the second thing about science is when you do science, you're looking at one thing and trying to control other variables. And when you think about it in your, in terms of, of your life, let alone your sport, how easy is that to just let, to focus on one thing and control the variables? Debbie, can you do it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a matrix and it's a dynamic matrix. So, and then a lot of science is, is talking about correlation, not causation. So it's like, like red meat causes cancer. That's one of the most popular ones out there. Like cholesterol causes heart disease. Correlation is not causation. Okay. Um, and then there's confirmational and what I call confirmational biases. And we all have these as humans. And, and that was one of the things that like, like um, we see a lot of is people just, they're gonna put out and, and see what they think and believe is the right thing. And even a lot of good scientists do this. And then another thing is, this is a term that I have a lot of trouble dealing with, even though everybody uses it, and that's biohacking. And it's sort of a term that's come out of tech and because we live on the internet, we're actually able to do this wonderful webinar here. Biohacking has been this term that's come up out of the tech world. And biology doesn't work that way. Biology is this fluid, ma dynamic matrix where everything touches everything else in a, in a very integrated, holistic way. And that's why both Debbie and I coach this way. You can't biohack a biological system. Because once you touch one thing, you've touched everything else. Everything else changes. Everything else changes. And it's this wonderful matrix. You have to kind of go with that. So I hope that point gets well taken by people out there. So I've come up with this thing called the OFM pyramid, which is similar to what Debbie's doing. We're, we're talking about a holistic method to get to where you're optimizing your fat metabolism. And that, you know, you, you, we get you in your fat adapted metabolic state. It's, to, it's really about nutrition and not calories. Um, and one of the things we're, I'm seeing very consistently is 20 or more percent net caloric efficiency, which means once you get the nutritional balance, more, more so than the nutritional density, but the nutritional balance right, you need less calories and you feel much better. And then again, stomach and gut health, which Debbie's gone over, training and lifestyle, and that lumps in the, the, the stress. And, and Debbie's absolutely right. All the different stressors are as big an issue as the carbohydrates. Um, 
no, no, no question there. Hydration becomes a huge part of, of fat adaptive performance. And, and um, if you're doing that, we could, we'll probably have a podcast on that. And then Vespa's become an integral part. And uh, with the emerging data that we're starting to see, um, it's verifying that it's contributing substantially to increasing fat oxidation rate. And then on top of that is strategic carbohydrates. And while that may seem counterintuitive on the, on the top end, it's like I say, strategically put carbs are the rocket fuel to drive your performance. And when you drive that performance and you have that push that the carbs give you, they give you that adaptive stress to continue to get stronger and fitter and be able to perform at your best. And that's how we lead you to your optimizing your fat metabolism. So let's go on. And then back to what I was saying earlier. Again, you're an individual. Okay. And I can't stress this enough because we live in a world where we're made to feel like a special snowflake, but really we're being lumped into these target markets and commoditized to be sold a commodity because that's how you make money. It's, you know, one of my business advisors has talked to me about, do you think the coaching is worth doing? Cause it's not very, lucrative because you're doing one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Debbie, any comments on that? I mean, you, we do this because we know that this is the proper way to do it. Yeah, I think for sure. I keep stressing that. I think every day that all these programs there and you listen, well, saying you look in the Facebook group pages, everyone's thinking everyone has the same program to follow. And that's what you and I really work on that intuitive nutrition and intuitive training and performing and racing is that it's, so individual person to person. I just said to my clients of the day, unless you were born from the same parent at the same time, yeah. when they're a twin, they're going to be the same, but you're not going to be able to do the exact same program as someone else and expect the same results. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that's something, and that's sort of a take home message. And along with that, like they say in the gym, nobody does your pushups for you. So, as much as a coach or a program can do for you, you know, we're all addicted to convenience and we all want that simple answer, but you know, you really got to think about things and think about how it works in your world because it won't be sustainable otherwise. So this next picture is Diane Credenda. And I think she's like 64 in this picture and she's on the left. Um, and that's her winning Ironman St. George 7.3. And last year she was um, third overall at the 70.3 worlds. Um, but I, I, I don't want to beat up on the poor gal on the right who got fourth in her age group, but this is a good picture to look at about what happens when you get your body metabolizing fat versus what happens when you have too many carbs that kills your mitochondria off through the oxidative stress and lactate load. You get a lot of um, the visceral abdominal organ fat. You can see right here, this woman has a spare tire. Whereas, Peter, that's I, not fair. What's that? <laughs> You should cover their faces up. That's not fair to the girl. I know. I know. I didn't do that. You're right. I should. I should. Uh, I don't want to meet, beat up on her. I, I'm trying to help people understand this, but you're right. I, I'll have to smudge that thing. Let's go to the next one. You're right. Let's, uh, let's, we have a couple more, and then I want to get to questions our last 15 minutes. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And, and one, of the, one of the things you're going to notice when you're fat adapted, and especially if you're using the Vespa, is how quickly you recover um, and, and it's not because you really recover faster. It's really because you haven't done the damage in the first place. And this allows you to take that training stress and instead of recovering from it, you actually get super compensation, which is about getting stronger. And then the other thing we've seen is um, we redefine ketosis because a lot of people are using the traditional keto numbers. Like you got to have at least 0.18 millimoles to be in ketosis and and you got to have 50, you can't have you know everybody's crapping their pants if you go over 50 grams a day we see people running fit athletic fat adapted athletes run lower ketone levels and higher glucose levels and they can tolerate a lot more than 50 grams of carbs which we can talk about in the q a so and that's it and this is jenny capel i love this picture because this is her running to second and she was one of those athletes that was having gi just you don't have that slide up. Redefining gonna... ketosis. What is the level of ketosis is optimal? Well, when you look at that um, graph, it is so it's going down to just if you're even if you're making trace ketones, you're 
you're doing well as a fat adapted athlete because it's not what's in because when you measure your blood ketones it's what's in your blood that's not what you're metabolizing and what i think happens is when you get really well fat adapted as a athlete your body actually prefers ketones over glucose for most of the sedentary stuff for that fast hard push it's glucose but for most of your functions where ketones and glucose are in, interchangeable, we tend to see that um, that ketones are just as much or more preferred over glucose for those kind of dependent metabolic functions. Yeah, versus nutritional ketosis or for chronic health issues. Right, because the nutritional ketosis, the, 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 and, and this is the thing the audience needs to understand. The body of science on ketosis is, has been done until faster and a few other studies. It's all been about sedentary or metabolically compromised people, people who are overweight, type 2 diabetes, seizure, grand mal seizures, all kinds of metabolic issues that ketogenic diets seem to correct or put in remission. And so the, we're not talking about athletes. And, and, and there's, there's a huge difference between somebody who's fat adapted and athletic versus somebody who's sedentary and fat adapted. And, and, and just as much as there's a big difference in the metabolism, metabolic pathways, like, like we showed up in those first slides about the energy partitioning, how somebody uses their pathways to develop energy. It's just hugely different. So a car burner, a car burner's athletics uh, athletes, metabolic pathways are very different from a fat adapted athletes. Well, just as much so a fat adapted athletes pathways and outcomes are very different from a sedentary person. So if you guys can type in your questions, there's a Q&A section. I can click and it says open question. There's no questions. And then we can tell which ones to answer. So if you have any questions or else we'll just keep talking because both of us can easily do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to feel questions. So we want, don't be shy. I know. So you guys let me know what questions you have so you can just type them in the Q and A section and we can see if anyone has questions. No one's typing anything yet. So you can keep talking, Peter. On I'll, ta I'll talk a little bit about some, some stuff. If you haven't heard, we just last Friday, a poster came up on some pilot data we've done on Vespa because for years and years, I, and I have to admit, this is a shortcoming of mine. I'm, I'm kind of like a, I'm a peer, an empiricist. I was married to a research science scientist. Some of my best friends are PhD scientists in some, of the, in some very high positions. They're really, I'm surrounded by people who are way smarter than me. And so I've learned what, and I know scientific method because I have a BS from B in biology from UC Davis. And so I know what rigorous scientific method is. So I'm not a scientist. I'm an empiricist. I just get it done in the real world. So I've been very focused on results. And when I started marketing Vespa and distributing in the U.S., I was focused on getting athletes results, not on studies. And everybody says, where's the data? Where's the data? And it's like, what, did, what data do you need? It works. And, you know, we have athletes like Jeff Browning or Zach Bitter or uh, Beth James or um, Diane in that picture. We have all these athletes who, who are out there and people are starting to listen to them, but they still want to see that data. Um, none of these people who are using Vespa, including some doctors and scientists, they don't need a study to tell them it works. But, and that's kind of been what I've been. And that's been sort of arrogant on my part. But anyway, we've got some data. I finally got a researcher to do some pilot testing on Vespa and they um, published a poster last week. And I can, sh I think I can share that if I pull it up. Let me see if I can pull that up. Oh, okay. So, let me, let me. I have other slides here on salt we didn't talk about and I can put that on the screen while you're trying to see if you can Okay. Yeah. I can't, I can't share while you're sharing, but, um, do you, want, do you want me to pull up that screen? Well, let me just, can you just mention the salt screen? Cause I think this is an important part before we move yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so it's important. It's so salt is really important for athletic performance, no matter what you're doing, but as you get more fat adapted, it becomes even more critical. Uh, and I, I lumped salt into proper hydration because everybody knows they need to hydrate, but
but they tend to think of that more as water and quote unquote electrolytes. But it's re that electrolyte is mostly sodium because over 80% of the electrolyte profile in your sweat is sodium slash salt. And that's why sweat tastes salty. So we see athletes, you know, when they're, especially when you're in the heat, you need to really figure out what that proper mix of salt to water you're going to need to, to be able to, to maintain your sweat rate and not start pulling potassium out of your cells and creating what Debbie calls rightfully so metabolic chaos. Because when you get that, your body starts pulling electrolytes out of your liver and your bones, and then, then it gets low on sodium and it starts to pull potassium out of your cells and it's trying to compensate when it's really not getting what it needs. It becomes, it can become really bad really quickly. And it takes a lot longer to come out of a, out of the slow bonk of, of not having your hydration right than, than the fast bonk of, of sugar, of being, you know, depleted on sugar. So, you know, we see anywhere from in the heat, it can be anywhere from six, 800 milligrams of sodium an hour to one and a half grams of sodium an hour for a big guy who sweats a lot in the heat. And it's just keeping up. And, and that's with a lot of water, but um, how much that is and what that ratio is, it, it varies. I'm, I'm, I would say you need about um, 100 milligrams of sodium salt per every four to six ounces of water um, as a guide. And like as we transition into winter, we're going to need a lot less hydration. But as we transition into summer and spring, you need a lot more. It's, it, and so unfortunately, I was talking to an athlete today about this. As we go from summer into fall, people tend to overhydrate and then they start to pick up water fluid weight. Um, here we are with the whole comic about learning to do it perf perfect. And, and I don't know how many athletes are out there like that, but this is a comic I love because so many of the athletes that I work with are type A and they just want it perfect. And it's like, that's the worst thing you can do, especially if you're doing ultra endurance sports because things are going to go wrong. Got it. Oops. Okay. So any questions you listeners have, we have the last little screen here, I think. Oh, this is about stress. Low well, we organic, non-GMO, grass-fed. You know, talking about what foods to eat, I think it's confusing for a lot of people. We just yeah, like, just just keep eat. doing that. And this is what's going. This is what you're being fed into your brain. And this is that's what it is. So, my goal is to just get people eating fresh, whole foods. Like the thing is, and and this is the way you can do it cheaply because. If you can't afford to go to Whole Paycheck or Sprouts or the farmer's market, go to your local supermarket, buy the meat and eggs on sale and poultry and fish on sale because they use that as a loss leader, buy the produce in season, stay out of those middle aisles where all the processed stuff is, and you actually can save money because the stress of being financially strapped is, is just as big as the stress about making sure your food's all this kind of right stuff. There's, there's too much there's too much emphasis on the details with foods and not about just getting the foods right. And then another thing um, that's not in the slides here, Debbie, is I would say to people, beware of any food that comes up with this magnificent health halo. Okay. Um, you see, especially when there's a lot of marketing behind it. Um, you know, seed oils are a big one, like flaxseed or soy was a big one until that all got exposed. Um, you know, um, anything with this health hill, like even kale, kale and spinach. If you eat too much raw kale or raw spinach, you're going to wind up with problems because they're, they're tremendous mineral binders and you wind up nutrient deficient. And, and the, and the, the hard science on that is really clear. Uh, but nobody sees oh, those, those basic research studies. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So we you have know, a couple minutes before the webinar will end. So we have three minutes so if you guys give us any feedback and how the podcast or sorry webinar works for you what you would suggest learning more of so we can figure out how to develop monthly webinars that work for you to help keep educating athletes how to perform better and work on longevity that would be great to get feedback as this is our first experimental webinar and we'll do more 
in the future so you have more interaction so sadly yeah. interacting with us so we don't know what's going on but next time we can go live on facebook and youtube i just did not choose to do that today but yep. you just finished up what this holistic paradigm is about scientifically guided real world driven and finish up with that yeah well interesting more what you're doing science guided we're trying to be holistic and look at how evolution shaped us that's the that's the fundamental question that that drives my work is is when i go back to that and look at it from that perspective everything makes sense and that's where i find the answers and solutions but if you you know not i i really um you know i use a lot of these man-made tools and i use data but i always look back at that evolutionary context to kind of guide that thing and, and that's why it's so holistic and, and why you know you're coaching this way Debbie is because you have to look at everything and, and unfortunately we think we have to look at things in a compartmentalized scientific way which actually helps us to learn and data helps us to quantify so we can guide us but it's not the way it really works and you know when you're racing you want to be that intuitive athlete that can just get in and just subconsciously know what you need to do yeah, and I think it is, it's a whole process and we need to keep educating people this because especially if people are racing, this is typically their off season and hopefully there is an off season for you as I made the mistake of not having an off season, maybe off triathlon season, but I still would do more racing. And this is a great opportunity to work on creating the right foundation in your body for your body systems to work to set yourself up to be optimizing your fat metabolism as Peter and I are sharing. And how to become fat adapted isn't just about throwing in lots of fats in your diet and dropping the carbohydrates. There's so much more to it. And I think we're both trying to spread that information out there because I think, Peter, I don't know if you're, you're in those different Facebook group pages for athletes and the different keto for beginners and i'm oh, find it overwhelming all the thousands of people in these these groups and how much misinformation is told and again it's n equals one and it depends on the person but there's so much information out there that i wish we could you know keep help clarifying what's really fundamental to becoming a fat adapted individual or athlete yeah um there's a if you go to i have a uh free uh, ebook um, that we, we, we offer to people and it's, it's called beyondketo.info and it helps kind of clarify the whole keto thing and, and show, and we, we have those graphs in there. I actually developed those graphs on fuel partitioning for that book um, to kind of, uh, it's beyondketo.info and it helps kind of cut through that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough read, but like, like I said earlier, and, and as you know, nobody does your pushups for you and we're not, you know, we're not here to, to, to make it easy, we're, we're here to get your results. And, and people have to realize that, you know, if somebody's giving you this like quick and easy 30 day challenge, you, you might want to be a little suspect. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all we have time for today, you guys. So we thank you for coming on our podcast slash webinar to help you learn more. And you can find Peter at bestofpower.com and me at debbiepotts.net. So thank you. We look forward to talking to you more on our next webinar. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to the Whole Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at wholeathletepodcast.com. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again and see you next time.